Hi, this is Harold from Turbo Necro. Listen to the Thomas Eriksson podcast right here, right now. Prick up your ears, you hear? Hi, hi. God dag och välkommen. Hello. Welcome back to the Thomas Eriksson podcast, episode number 35. This is a first I'm actually recording outside on my uh, balcony at the moment. Hopefully that will work out sound-wise. It's been a little while since the last episode, yet again, as it is, because I'm basically prioritizing different stuff uh, my music and life in general uh, if you don't know who i am yet i am thomas eriksen i play in a norwegian black metal band called mork which i started in 2004 it's been going as a solo project all the years up to now but we also have a live uh, lineup that we bring around the world and uh, play gigs uh, signed to the legendary Peace Will Records of uh, the UK, released um, five full-length albums, and uh, obviously been touring here and there across the globe. And uh, there will be more of that this year. Uh, we just recently played uh, a small but very cozy festival up in uh, Toten, Norway, called Garage Festival, that was nice. Um, and we are heading to Wacken Open Air now in August. On the 4th of uh, August is the Wacken uh, gig. And then we head to Midgarsblot in Horten, Norway uh, on the 17th of August. And then that weekend on the 20th of August, we will go to Piskovice in Poland to play a festival there. And then in September, it's a big one, it's our first Latin American tour uh, that will basically go on from the 4th of September until the 11th. And in between those uh, dates we will visit uh, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, uh, Paraguay, Chile, Colombia and Mexico. That will be huge for us. Uh, then uh, we get back home to Norway and play the Northern Deception Festival in Kristiansand on the 23rd of September. Uh, then we are playing the Spetakkel Festival in Larvik uh, on the 29th of September. Before heading to Mörkaste Småland uh, in Sweden uh, on the 8th of October. And uh, I suppose that's all the gigs for now. Uh, more will come along. I suppose. And by the way, if you if you give a rat's ass about uh, all this music talk and my band that I'm uh, constantly pushing in your face, you can um, you can support it and uh, end the podcast automatically if you just head over to the official web shop of uh, Mark to buy some merchandise and vinyl, CDs and stuff, uh, patch for your jacket. We even have body bags now. And. Uh, that's much appreciated. The link is somewhere in the description around this uh, podcast episode, if I have done my uh, homework correctly. It's been a wild week, actually. Uh, it's actually summer vacation in Norway now, and I suppose for the rest of the world, uh, to the people who are lucky enough to have some time off. I uh, started off uh, with a few days at Nocturno Költo's house. That was nice. He taught me how to play frisbee golf which i uh, i think i sucked at it but i uh, i got there you know in the end i threw when i threw the the frisbee went in the, the direction i wanted it to so that's good thanks ted and then i went to finland and that was uh, a excellent experience um a while back, uh, I got to know um, Ero uh, of the Finnish uh, funeral doom legends, uh, skepticism. I got in touch with him 
back when I was recording uh, Cathedral, the album that came out in 2021, uh, for him to perhaps contribute with a church organ part for uh, my uh, uh, epic song on that album. Because I remember back in the days when I discovered uh, black metal, extreme metal, whatever, I also f found uh, Funeral Doom. And uh, Skepticism was one of the first bands that I kind of clicked into there. And uh, I remember it was... Uh, it's so unique, genre and style. And uh, it has been with me ever since as a kind of atmosphere. And uh, when I wrote this uh, song that I'm talking about, I uh, figured out it. the end part of it uh, kind of uh, reminded me of uh, Funeral Doom. So why not make it a complete circle and uh, a part of my life journey? So why not just ask that guy from Finland to maybe do something? And uh, he obliged. And uh, we also got to hang out in London once when we went over there to see Skepticism play live which was great and uh, turned out to be a great stand-up guy uh, he's become a, become a friend by now so uh, we were invited over to his uh, Finnish home and uh, summer cottage over there north of Helsinki somewhere in the middle of the woods and uh, because of the COVID situation this, uh, tr this uh, tr pleasure trip has been just put off for two years and now finally we made it happen uh, I was introduced to the traditional old school smoke sauna that the uh, Finns have, which is uh, probably the, the blackest experience I've ever had, and perhaps the hottest too. But it was beautiful. Uh, the cottage was right there in the woods. Uh, the the sauna was just a few meters uh, below, and just a few meters after that was a lake freshwater lake so we were sitting in the sauna just jumping directly into the lake and uh, no other houses around complete uh, silence and uh, desolation and that was beautiful a really special event was uh, when Edo uh, gathered us up in his car and uh, we just headed out on a short um, sightseeing of the local area around the cottage which also happens to be his childhood home uh, and uh, place of origin. Uh, as a part of that, we went to a medieval church from, I think it was the 13 or uh, 1400s or something. It was uh, yay old. And we just uh, walked around the outside of the church for a while, looking at some old graves and looking at the building in itself, which was uh, stunning, obviously. And all of a sudden, uh, an old guy came along and uh, uh, greeted Edo. Turned out that was actually the local uh, organist for that church. And Edo had planned out a special treat for us uh, where we got let into the church, uh, only a few of us. And Edo sat at the organ, a pipe organ in that church, and he performed the very part he did for the Mork album, live for me, in the church, which was uh, just insane. As well as some cool little snippets from uh, Skepticism's uh, uh, catalogue. That was a nice treat. A great guy, and uh, obviously I brought my uh, recording gear over there, so we did a podcast episode. I had to have a podcast about Skepticism and uh, Eero's story there. So uh, that is what this episode is. So no further uh, further stuff to bring up, I think. Uh, you should just enjoy the episode. I really did. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Until next time. See ya! Overconfident and cocky. Being Elvis is that. Cocky, not cuckoo? Uh, cuckoo. Uh, what's that? The beer? Cuckoo? Cuckoo, yeah. Cuckoo. Uh, uh, not, not that. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. The Norway also... cuckoo is uh, cuckoo. Yeah. In our hometown, Rihimaki, there's a handball team called the Rihimaki Cox. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they I won... have no doubt. 
uh, they have won the championship uh, several times. But in the 80s, no one understood that a cock means something else but the male chicken. No, I never thought anything else. Never. Yeah, well, so uh, it, yes. I, it would be really cool to see the Reem, uh, sell the Rehimaki cocks t-shirts to the Americans. <laughs> hey, you know what? I th- actually think we're good to go. So we can bring on the coffee. Yes. All right. We need to get away the groupies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's that's what it like to be. Popular, Thanks for the know. coffee. How are you liking the Tuska? I haven't uh, tasted it yet. It's nice. It's mm. nice. It's a bit mild. I like it a bit more closer to the espresso ones. You know, a bit stronger. It's my taste. Yeah, there's kind of an an element of tar in it. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna for me taste wise. Uh, this was Tuska from mm-hmm. the festival. Yeah. Well, uh, a co operation one. So this is uh, basically a dark roast done by a Finnish roasting company. So we are basically promoting Tuska Festival now, so they have to book Mork next year. Uh, that might be a fact. It's uh, obligatory, I think. <laughs> to those who don't know, I am sitting in uh, the south of Finland right now. And uh, we've been staying here for a couple of days, actually, uh, in the good company of uh, and hosting of Ero Puri. Is that the right name to say it? Your last name? Uh not really. No, oh, but, but it, it, it was a fair try. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, not that either. It's uh, the Finnish pronouncing is Pöyry. Pöyr. Pöyry. There's a Y in the end. Eero also. Pöyry. Yeah, but that's that's pretty close. Thank yeah, you. yeah. I won't try again. Uh, we stick to Eero from now. <laughs> uh, we had a couple of amazing days at your cottage uh, with the Finnish uh, uh, traditional smoke sauna. Uh, just by the lake, good drinks, good food, and good company. So I thank you so much for that, man. You are most welcome. And this is something we agreed on before the pandemic. So just before COVID broke out, I met Thomas for the first time in London. And we agreed that, well, first of all, project number one is that we'll complete that one organ part for the Cathedral and Album. Yes, and I said, and when you come to Finland, we will get a traditional Finnish sauna experience. And then there was a pandemic, so now it finally happened after two and a half years. But we are true to our words. Yes, yeah. we stick together. Yeah, and uh, it was kind of uh, great in a sense that well, I told you that it's going to happen, and then it was maybe two weeks ago when you kind of pinged me saying like, well. How about now? Yep. And you didn't need to ask whether the kind of invite is still up. Mm-hmm. Well, I said it is, so hey, it is. We are grateful. Thank you very much. And we will be back. Yes. We will. Also something worth mentioning, I think, is that uh, you guys arrived uh, late on Monday night. Mm. So we got to drive through the Finnish uh scenery yep. in the summer night it it has a feeling of its own so it it was a nice thing to experience together absolutely absolutely but um yeah i have um, told you this plenty of times that's the reason why i made the contact for the first time doing my album and stuff like that i remember back when when i started getting into the deeper and more extreme genres of metal uh, I remember scrolling through all of the different branches of the metal tree. And uh, you had black metal, you had uh, death metal and all, that, all those, uh, the doom metal. And then I came across something called funeral doom. And uh, then uh, skepticism was one of the first names I think I came across. And the first thing I checked out. And uh, it still has an effect on me all those years later. I still remember that first little snippet of uh, sign of a storm on the net there and uh, really I don't know unique sound and uh, when I came up with my own uh, riffs and uh, the song for the end song uh, title track of the Cathedral album 
I stumbled into this funeral doom-ish feel at the end of the riff, and I just thought it would be amazing to have that organ player from Skepticism do this, because it's a tie-up and tie together from my background and history in music. And I actually tracked you down. And you obliged, you did, and now we are here. So, hey, it's a circle. And of course we need an episode with you regarding your story. And uh, I think we should just start at the beginning. Yeah, and before going to the beginning, yeah. um, do you remember which part of Sign of a Storm was there that you, that you heard? I think it was about uh, maybe 30 seconds to a minute or something from, for, from the start yeah. Yeah, of the track. Uh, my personal experience with that very song is that we had made the one tape uh, with four songs uh, and we thought we need a couple of more to make an album. Mm. And we started writing Sign of a Storm uh, and it felt, felt like the opening track from the beginning. I do remember the very rehearsal where I uh, heard us play the opening riff together for the first time. Uh, and the feeling of that, like this is going to be the opening. Uh, kind of for me as a musician, there was probably similar kind of a experience of the song as it was for you. Uh, as a listener, kind of the first experience of the first, yeah, first riff. Yeah, just wanted to share. Yeah, that cool. Thought. We will get to that uh, record also, I suppose. Uh, I believe we will. Yeah. Where it, did uh, what, tell, tell me about your childhood and how you got started into being you? Well, um, like Thomas said in the beginning, we went to a place uh, nearby Hamelin. Finland, uh, which is a small village called Tuulos, and that is the place where I have the first childhood memories. And um, uh, the place where we had the smoke sauna mm. was actually next to my childhood home. But kind of a, the story of becoming me starts from when I was 10 years old. Uh, me and my family moved to a uh, small town, a bit south uh, in Finland, like uh, an hour north from Helsinki called Riihimäki. Uh, I was used to the countryside uh, activities. It was different uh, to live in a, in a town. But I went to school and on my class there were these dudes called Jani and Lasse. Uh, I spent time with other dudes uh, quite much, but I got to know these, these guys and uh, years passed and in about four or five years we were teenagers and um, I had started to play guitar uh, around that time, um, mm. which was the first instrument for me. I kind of suddenly got into music. Uh, not kind of going through uh, a lot of music listening in the earlier years, but just kind of a, it hit me uh, around the uh, age of 15. And what hit me was the brutal death metal. Okay, yeah. Uh, so kind of many of us come through a kind of a uh, metal education of uh, kind of a going through Iron Maiden and Accept and Dio and, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, those things didn't really light up lamp in my head wow but, but then when i heard growling <laughs> in the death metal side that really hit me hard and also it's kind of uh, at that point in the late 80s uh, early 90s um, the kind of a the underground death metal scene was was really kind of a, a flourishing and, and that stuff uh, rather than hearing the stuff you hear on radio shows and what whatnot, but to kind of uh, get to hear the raw underground stuff uh, by those C cassette demos on the concerts and all that. So so kind of that felt uh, real and genuine and kind of uh, something that uh, practically blew my mind. So kind of my musical first love, maybe uh, kind of uh, surprisingly uh, was brutal underground death metal that's hardcore 
Yeah, <laughs> that is. And, and then... Kind but of did, a, did, did you do the tape trading thing also with the letters and everything? Uh, not the actual tape trading, but I would uh, get as many uh, fans and zines as possible. And back in the day, you would order, uh, you'd get with the zine, you would get a, a kind of a handful of flyers in it. Uh, and they would say, kind of, here's this and this kind of demo, order it by IRC, so or put kind of a ten dollars into the uh, letter. Yeah. And I would do that. And uh, I have a bunch of uh, those underground demos from the time. And also, well, let's get to that in a minute, but mm -hmm. kind of a still re rewinding to kind of how did I get to music. I got uh, kind of a albums uh, copied into C cassette from these people who were on my class. Uh, and I got into that music. I, I thought, well, I, I need to start learning guitar. I got a guitar and um, around that time uh, I was doing sports as a younger boy, uh, but I, I got rid of that and, and got into music. Good, uh, good. Uh, yeah, kind of, <laughs> uh, I sometimes say it so that kind of a, I got an injury uh, uh, in the spring when I was uh, 15, and that injury was a really good uh, segue for me to say, that, well, okay, I'm done with sports and, and uh, well, I'm going to concentrate on the guitar now. And then what happened was that uh, these friends of mine... Uh, had been starting a band and they were looking for members they had tried some people in there but they're gonna um, they wanted to find people who would stick around and mm. they could kind of uh, build something in the longer term so so they were looking for a good band member not probably the best possible musician at the, that point of time no. so they would ask me to join the band and uh, I of course wanted to join that uh, to play the kind of a uh, second guitar and, and of course I was interested in uh, writing as well uh, and uh, I had some skill in English uh, well at the age what it wasn't really surprising but uh, kind of a uh, writing lyrics was really something I was interested in so that would be my role in the band and then uh, as the months passed by at that time we kind of eventually you'd uh, learn to play and, and uh, kind of uh, get introduced into the kind of a uh, feeling of playing music together. It's it's very different from listening to music. Ab or absolutely, but I just need to stop. Uh, what were what was the what kind of music was those guys doing? Was it death metal? What what were you doing at the very beginning? Uh, yeah, um, at the very beginning, uh, <coughs> yeah, I of course do have recordings of those really early days mm. uh, so it was pretty much what you would imagine uh, what 15 year olds compose after being exposed to other kind of a more mainstream metal and then the underground uh, brutal death metal and the underground metal tied at that time was really on the brutal death metal side so it was uh, songs about decomposition and, and Satan more than oh. uh, than other topics that emerged later. Uh, but yeah, the, the early songs we wrote were kind of death metal e, uh, and even the first release of the band in '92, you could say it's kind of slow death metal uh, or death slash doom, in a sense. Uh, but kind of what we noticed was that. Uh, we liked the raw energy of the death metal styles hmm. of that time, but we especially liked the kind of a slower moshing, uh, slow moshing uh, uh, places of those death metal songs. That they, you, you have those kind of a, uh, you slow down for a moment before the next blast beat. Mm -hmm. So kind of we noticed that we enjoyed those bits the most and kind of, that was the direction we would, would be taking, like emphasizing those kind of uh, heavy, slow bits. Hmm. And um, yeah, so we wrote maybe 10 ish songs uh, that were kind of uh, disposable. Uh, and then we eventually wrote a couple that we were really happy with. Mm -hmm. And we would, uh, we had seen some local bands release seven inch EPs yeah. or, or singles. 
uh, at the time and uh, we decided to do one ourselves um, and um, we had two songs for that uh, the other one was uh, considerably weaker and we kind of while we had already booked the studio time and before recording we came up with a better one so okay yeah so so then it, it, it was just fresh the best thing we could produce uh, mm -hmm. two songs uh, we spent four and a half hours in the studio including setup recording and mixing yeah. and uh, it was an interesting experience in that, a sense that was a seven inch that was a seven inch yes well, and how long songs uh, the songs are five six minutes i think and they are like in the same uh, funeral doom element that you became or is mm. it more death uh, slow death yeah i would say that is slow death okay uh, so once we are done talking I'll, I'll play that stuff back to you awesome. but, uh, yeah it's kind of a it's it is slow death that's uh, the fair um fair description of that on the other hand when you listen to that uh having listened to what we've done since mm. you will probably recognize it as us yeah it's uh, a signature th thread going on uh in a sense yes but i would say that the signature sound of skepticism emerged only in the coming years so that was the kind of a um, starting point but this was only guitars no organ and stuff yes so, okay uh, so, so this was two guitars bass uh, drums and vocals yeah and we did that uh we made a small pressing of them uh we didn't get uh, a huge amount of attention for that, which is maybe even fortunate. Um, but what happened next was was kind of a, uh, the prelude for the defining moment for the band. So mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we had a bass player who left. Yeah. And we were thinking, what should we do? So should the vocalist learn the bass? Should uh, we find a new bass player? Should we... Uh, have bass at all uh, and kind of in the same line of thinking uh, why they recruited me which was this kind of we know this guy we trust this guy he will probably stick around mm. so we thought maybe it's better not to stir the pot and, and find another uh, person who would need to learn to be in there but just let's stick with these four people okay then we had some idea of what the sound of the band should be like and which direction to take that and then there was the fact that i was interested in keyboards because i i personally liked uh, or found the sound of the pipe organ fascinating uh, in a sense as a finn you would hear the pipe organ in a church uh, in funerals in weddings mm. uh, and baptisms and and that would be associated in your brain into moments of, of sorrow or joy mm -hmm. uh, and then there is the sound of your average Finnish church pipe organ which is uh, kind of soft uh, and, and kind of deep at the same time so I was really into that uh, and then uh, kind of at that point keyboards were kind of emerging uh, for metal as well in many demos at that time kind of the band wouldn't own a keyboard but there would be one in the studio so you would improvise something but was uh, it was it a lot of usage of uh, that pipe organ effect on the bands around at the time uh, did you hear a lot of that i can't really recall on the other hand uh what you would hear is that there's kind of a, a, a kind of separate intro for a song or for a demo uh, and for those, well, you could do something like uh, the Phantom of the Opera style yeah. uh, pipe organ intro. Like gothic kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. and of course the, the gothic uh, metal thing was uh, getting started at those times as well. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we didn't really have a reference of what uh, keyboards would be like in music that would be drawing heavily from slow death metal. So, well, I just got a keyboard, keyboard borrowed one from a friend uh, and we were thinking like does it even make sense to have keyboards in this sort of music so i got that instrument we went to the practice room uh with the drummer and went like well let's play a couple of songs and hit record and improvise mm -hmm. and then we presented that to the other guys and we we're like would something like this be acceptable for the band figured like yeah there's there's promise into that um and 
So it was basically only your fascination for the pipe organ that started that idea? To yeah. Uh, th th there was that. Uh, there was uh, the fact that we wanted to stick with the people we had, uh, and then we wanted to find a sound which would be kind of more our own because it's um, there's less wiggle room if you are working with two guitars and, and bass. Mm. Um, so, so kind of we wanted to find something that's kind of would uh, fit the kind of music that we had some sort of vision for, and mm. then then kind of wanted to. Um, find a setup that suits us. So then, um, after that kind of a validation round, that kind of, could we make keyboards work for this band? Mm. Uh, I got an uh, actual uh, keyboard instrument that was back in 93. And I still have that very, <laughs> very instrument. I It has been my master keyboard since, uh, and it will be until later this year. Uh, uh, I'm going to replace it because it's getting old. It's from the year 87. That or, one? Originally, no, the one I play. Okay. Uh, and then Thomas saying that one is, there's a prototype of my new keyboard on my yeah. desk right now, which is inverted black and white keys. Anyway, nice. hmm. so so that thing I bought back in 93 uh, served me well for 30-ish years. Yeah. And um, then as the bass player left, and we, of course, understood that we need to have something on the bass frequencies as well. I got the bass pedals uh, for uh, the keyboards as well. So kind of the allegory for me, being the keyboard player in the band, would be to have the church organist in the band. And, and kind of a, a both kind of style-wise and, and kind, of a, a kind of how do you relate to that thing, being in the band. So... How I saw metal bands using keyboards at that time would be that you would have a normal setup like um, two guitars, bass, and then a keyboard player on top Doing of that. Doing the mid-range and high stuff. Yeah, and, and mm. it could be like a patch in the background. So, so kind of a, already when you have the, that many people in there, you need to arrange space for mm. that. Yep. Uh, so for as we were less people, it's kind of a... And, and I used to be the second guitarist. Pretty much what I end up doing is is being the second guitarist on keyboards and and then uh, doing uh, and filling in for the bass player as well. So kind of the the setup for that uh, was um, pushing the keyboards to be more prominent mm. than they would normally be in a kind of more field scenario. And um, then we started working on that. So. Um, at that point, we had written some songs that we were even happier with uh, than the first seven-inch uh, EP songs. And those song songs include, for example, Pouring, uh, The Rising of the Flames, and The Everdark Green, all of which appear on the first album. And those songs were written with two guitars in mind. And I've um, played those even live uh, on the guitar and um, I didn't know that until yesterday, but for example, The Rising of the Flames is still in my muscle memory yeah. uh, uh, for guitar. So kind of, uh, I just found it from there yesterday night. Yeah. So uh, we had those songs and then I got the keyboards and then I just, uh, we spent time kind of uh, adapting those songs for the keyboards. And then we, at that point, uh, we first made this uh, kind of a promotional tape of four of those songs. Uh, it became pretty good, kind of, I would say that was the first defining moment for the band. Like, what will the band sound like? Well, it will be uh, drums, guitar, keyboards, uh, and guitar, guitars and keyboards kind of pretty evenly there. So they would be kind of a, a forming uh, a common wall of sound. Mm. And then, then vocals, and, and that kind of uh, was the first kind of uh, sound of our own thing. And with that tape that we released, I think, I think we recorded that in '93 and released that in '94. Is that the album? Uh, that isn't the album. That was a tape called, uh, well, it was a promo tape 
the name of which I won't try to pronounce myself even. Oh, really? That's <laughs> yeah. hard Finnish. <laughs> <laughs> that is an. I, I, I can show you the tape at, at some point, but yeah. that was kind of a. It was a really good example of what the band could become. Then, uh, an American label called Red Stream uh, contacted us and wanted to release that tape uh, on CD. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to kind of uh, make an album. Uh, so we said that rather than doing that, we'd rather uh, re-record three of those four songs and add three new ones to make a real album. Mm. And that's kind of how we see that. And they agreed. Uh, we eventually became the first band they sent to studio to make an album. That, that label? Yeah, that okay. label. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Red Stream was um, doing kind of interesting stuff at that point. Um, uh, the thing was that they, the majority of their business was uh, sales of CDs mm. uh, by mail order. But on, on the other hand, they were also getting kind of music from movies and, and such and kind of publishing that on CD as well. Okay. So there were some... Uh, Soundtracks. Uh, yeah, and not many of those, but kind of a more esoteric ones and kind of a, kind of a, from weird... Uh, uh rare movies okay and, uh, that sort of thing and, and they were also signing some uh some other bands so so we went to studio um and did uh, a pretty intense session uh for those three new songs and, and three previous ones with the keyboards uh to save time we had a session keyboard player uh, sorry session bass player for that Oh. Who, who was um, also kind of a um, half a member of the band called Jukka Korpihete, who heavily contributed to the um, cover art of the first album and oh. the second album. Okay. Um, so he played session bass for uh, the Stormcrow Fleet album sessions. And um, we completed that. And it was released. Uh, some people really enjoyed it uh, back in the day uh, it was released in 95 so there was practically no internet and uh, hmm. the early communications with red stream uh, we had with the fax machine really yeah <laughs> uh, and of course uh, on the phone I suppose. Uh, on the phone but uh, but also land mail letters and, and all that so yeah um, things were pretty primitive uh, at that point uh, there was some exposure to the uh, album, uh, but it didn't really lead into many uh, kind of new things happening. So there were no shows. We were not playing live at that point at all. I've never played live. Uh, yeah, we had played live uh, in the guitar and bass phase. Yep, tell me about that. What was the first concert? Yes. So, uh, around the time when before or around when we released the first album uh, we played live in Riihimäki uh, I think it was 91 I, I, I kind of barely uh, learned to play at that point uh, the guitar and uh, it was a small audience just to kind of playing live just to play live mm. I think then uh, this is probably also kind of interesting. So at that time, Riihimäki, which is a small town in southern Finland, it was pretty much a death metal capital of Finland. Uh, not because we had the most bands, but because we had the most live shows. Okay. So, so there was a local guy who was organizing shows, and those happened kind of a, almost monthly. And any band practically that was interesting in the scene at that moment in Finland would play in Riihimäki. Yeah. And that was a rare privilege to have. So kind of a, to see the most interesting bands of the time, you would just kind of a walk to a gig in your hometown. So so we would see uh, kind of a uh, early Amorphis there. We would see Disgrace, uh, Xysma, uh, Demigod, those kind of... Uh, and, uh, uh, Impaled Nazarene played there and Unholy played there and, and, and kind of all of the interesting Finnish names hmm. uh, 
would turn up in my hometown. Was it like a small club or what was it? Uh, it, it was different places. Okay. And um, in the early 90s, uh, culture was different in a sense that uh, you would, for these gigs, you would rent these kind of dance hall kind of places and there wouldn't be any alcohol served uh, or anything like that. So it, it would be just kind of a space and then a bunch of metalheads gathering having beer from plastic bags outside and then going inside to hear the music. So it was several small venues in the town and for some bigger shows uh, there would be the main sports hall of the mm. town rented. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but anyway, it was, it was really uh, useful and kind of interesting and fascinating to get to see uh, kind of if there was a new... Uh, Kind of direction or uh, new fresh ideas in the underground scene happening, you would see that live soon-ish. Yeah. So, so it, it, it really was, current then. Yeah. yeah. And, and then there were kind of these people who would uh, kind of uh, the people who used to be the tape traders who would come there and and have um, uh, tapes and and vinyl uh, from underground bands for sale, and the bands were selling their stuff there and kind of going to those uh, gigs. You also got to. Uh, buy demos and and, and kind of uh, vinyls and and uh, magazines and all that. So that's excellent. It, yeah, that it, it was really kind of a. Uh, if you were interested in uh, in the underground stuff, you would be exposed to all of that in there, and that that was absolutely brilliant. It was a tight scene then. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it, it was. Um, maybe I wouldn't describe that scene as tight but it was uh, quite vibrant it was quite alive mm. and and then uh, also when I think of how would you keep in touch with people from different bands it would be land mail handwritten letters there's no email uh, there's only landline phones and even if you could call those other band members you normally wouldn't mm. so so sometimes uh I remember calling one guy from another band once to ask when their CD would be out, but that would be it. So, so it was mainly kind of really old school communication, and and also um, kind of um, if I would imagine what a tight scene is, that kind of it would be where you actively keep in touch uh, and kind of actively um, and supporting each other. Yeah, not and, being enemies, you know. Uh, yeah, my, my perception of how the scene was there, it was that it wasn't so much supporting each other. It, it was kind of a, and it wasn't enemies either. It was kind of more healthy like healthy competition, perhaps. Uh, that could be it, or or, or, mm. or one could say that it was uh, kind of neutral in a way. So kind of a, <laughs> maybe bands were being uh, neutrally suspicious of each other. There were some people. Um, in some bands who kind of uh, everyone knew. So I, if I remember right, the drummer of Demigod was one of those kind of uh, combining persons who kind of knew everyone and kind of would bring people together. But hmm. uh, I would imagine that, uh, for example, someone was describing the Tuska Festival as uh, a huge metal family coming together. Uh, I wouldn't imagine that anyone who went to the 90s gigs would say it's like a metal family coming together. But still, it was really enjoyable. And, mm. and, and there was little kind of a, uh, any of the negative sides of uh, people gathering. Yeah. Uh, uh, and just for fun, just for my own sake, I know that you went to see Dark Throne back yes, then. Yes, we did. For fun, just tell me about that experience. Yes. So, like I said, uh, for the bigger gigs, uh, the organizer guy would book the main concert hall or the main sports hall in in Riihimäki. Uh, the main sport in Riihimäki at the time was handball, and, and they had that uh, arena for that. Mm. Uh, and I did mention, Thomas, that in fact, the handball team of Riihimäki is called the Cox. <laughs> and, and it's still called that. It's a male uh, chicken, though. It's a hen. Yes, yes. Uh, that is that. But anyway, uh, in in that arena, uh, uh, the bigger shows were there. 
I don't recall the entire lineup of that gig, but for example, uh, there had been uh, before uh, shows where, for example, uh, Imbeth Nazarene and, and others played. Um, but then, if I remember right, on that show, there was someone playing uh, on a band that saw I was kind of helping uh, a band on stage, and because of that, I had kind of backstage pass and we watched the show of Dark Throne uh, not from the kind of area in front of the stage but from the kind of um, uh, audience area uh, for the handball matches so it, it was kind of a uh, the audience wasn't getting up there in the uh, upper yeah, uh, in seats the tri in the tribune. yeah, yeah. Uh, so we got to watch it from there and at that point when I thought of um, kind of watch Dark Throne well Dark Throne is that band from Norway that released uh, this album called Soulside Journey. Yes. And uh, and kind of there was not much to be expected. We knew those songs and, and people in the audience knew that. But then again, the point was mainly that, well, there's this band from Norway. Uh, and when there's a band from abroad coming, coming it, it needs to be interesting then. And, and maybe the audience was... Uh, in the hundreds, like 300, 400, maybe 500 people. That's quite good. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm not certain, but I believe they played a couple of songs from the upcoming, then upcoming album, um, A Blaze in the Northern Sky. Mm. Uh, and again, uh, uh, if my memory serves me right, they didn't play live much after that. But it was... Um, a remarkable show you could kind of sense that these guys are up to something mm. and uh, what happened in the coming couple of years at that point uh, to me the main uh, uh, wave in the underground metal was still brutal death metal yep. and kind of uh, the kind of uh, leading names uh, that were not underground anymore but kind of uh, uh, for that would be bands like Cannibal Corpse and Carcass and, and, and so forth. So the, there was the grind core, there was the kind of a, um, brutal things happening. But then after a blaze in the northern sky, the tide turned in a really wide sense. So kind of a, after that, black metal became a thing. Mm. Of course, people, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the kind of black metal historian, but kind of just describing how I experienced that is that people sometimes say that, well, but Venom released the black metal album back in blah, blah, blah. Yep. Uh, but for me, experiencing uh, or, and, or kind of having been into uh, the metal underground, uh, the change into, when you look right through the magazines, uh, the fanzines, and... Uh, Suddenly, after those albums, there would be half of the bands interviewed would be stating they are black metal, and uh, then there was the debate about trueness and whatnot. Mm. Uh, and if you can rewind the fanzines uh, into the time before those Dark Throne albums, uh, you won't see that. So, no. so you will see uh, bands named uh, something related to decomposition uh, and then uh, suddenly after that moment there are bands uh, kind of uh, named after darkness and uh, yep. death and satan yep. uh, and, and kind of um, to me that that you release something so influential mm. that it turns the tide of a subculture I, I think that's a remarkable achievement oh, it is it is yeah. So then, um, I can say that that would would have been directly visible on that very night, but still there was you could see that these these guys are up to something unusual. And I, I don't think you remember this, but I have seen videos, obviously, of the Finnish uh, tour they did. I don't yeah. know if it was that particular show or not, but Rinjehallen or something. I'm not sure, yeah. but I I do believe that they wore corpse paint. So it's closing in on the Ablaze era. So I think they yeah. were about to change over from the death, the technical yeah. death metal stuff to the black metal stuff. So you yeah. saw a 
make way shift there, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think they wore uh, at least the black uh, eye makeup. That may be. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but anyway, mm. it, it is speculation. There will be documentation about that yes, somewhere. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. YouTube, right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then kind of, it, it also kind of. I think that was a good example of, like I said, to me, it was so that if something interesting was happening in the underground uh, from the point of view of Finland, you would see that in, on the local gigs, mm. and that was really, really valuable. A person interested in that thing. Absolutely. So, so that was kind of a again the Dark Throne show was a good example of that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> we let's jump back to the album then. Your um, the first album. Yeah. Well, um, the first album um, it went pretty well uh, in a sense that we got it out. Uh, we got some exposure for that, but nothing kind of a groundbreaking happened uh, as a response so some people thought it was uh, slow and boring some people liked it and that was that but we immediately continued uh, uh, writing new music and we continued just need to ask when you released your first uh, album which I suppose is the first real example of what the band is yes were there anything similar previous to this uh, from other bands that is my main uh, thing I've been thinking about was Skepticism one of the first ones was it the first to did that kind of sound or well uh, I think it would be overstatement saying that we would have been I think the first Thurgodhon album was released well before ours and, and there are similarities in the sound um, and um, there are also others. So, so basically, also for me, I would say our signature sound uh, is somewhat present on the first album. But for me, the defining moment for that is more the second album. Okay. And I'll explain in a bit mm. in a bit more detail. So kind of there was extreme doom. Of that time, there was uh, in Finland at least uh, there was uh, the band called Thergothon. There was uh, Unholy. That was kind of a uh, with a bit uh, different angle. They were more in in the kind of a uh, avant-garde, uh, kind of really more complex sounding and, and really kind of a unique sound of their but own. But still uh, yep. sludgy and slow and stuff. Yep. Yeah, but are they inspired by the same thing you mentioned? The slow parts in death metal songs? I really can't tell. I, no? I, I, I don't know what those <laughs> bands were in, in, inspired by. So I haven't really talked to the members of them. Uh, so kind of where we came from was the slow uh, death metal. Uh, because the first, if you go back in history, I would suppose the first doom band is Black Sabbath. You know? Yeah. And, and and from Black Sabbath, I saw them live on, I think it was the year 96 or, no, it wasn't, it's 94 maybe. So. Uh, the one uh, with, back with Ozzy or the one with Dio? I think Or that, Tony Martin? I think that was with Ozzy. Uh, but yeah, I'm, the I, reunion uh, one then. Yeah, I, I, I'm not entirely certain, but I heard them play Black Sabbath, the song, uh, in a mild rain at the Finnish summer festival. And from Black Sabbath, uh, for me, that is the song that I enjoy. I'm not so into the other worshipped stuff there. <gasps> yeah, yeah. Uh, he almost punched me, mm. uh, but he's luckily... Uh, There's well, some distance between us now. Yeah. So so um, that has to be the starting point, I, I would say. Uh, and then uh, the more extreme varieties of... Like candle mass from Sweden and stuff yeah. like that, you know. Yeah, and, and then there was also this kind of... A, uh, everyone knows the kind of... A, uh, on the black metal side, the true or not true debate. Uh, there was also true or not true uh, discussion uh, on the doom metal side. Like, I'm sure. Or, I'm yeah, very sure. Uh, kind of a, there's uh, the doom metal, which is kind of a originating from uh, Black Sabbath, and and then there's these new styles like uh, the death doom and and kind of a funeral doom and and whatnot. Mm. Whether those are doom or not, I don't think the question is interesting, uh, but. Uh, at that time, the interesting thing is that uh, 
a lot of these bands were emerging around the same time. Of course, on, on the kind of a, there were bands like Cathedral, who was uh, really the, the Brits, yeah. yeah, really heavily drawing from the uh, doom metal tradition. I, I think uh, the debut album of Cathedral is is phenomenal. It's, it's they are really also good. using the pipe organ in the music, right? Um, or is no, it mainly rock set up? Uh, I don't really remember them using pipe organ so they, much. They, they probably didn't. I just uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they had really nice uses of, of the flute on the first album and, and all that. Flute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I honestly I haven't listened that much to it. I need to check it out a bit more. So yeah, but yeah. I, I recognize the name. Yeah, I do. So uh, that was brilliant, and and then of course there was uh, my dying bride. Uh, uh, and of course, when people relate to bands, uh, you tend to like their early work. And uh, I think the first yeah, that's the true part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. First and, album and the demo. <clears throat> yeah, everything and, else is shit because it's commercial. Yeah, no, of course we get I that just, as well. I the, the, had to let that out. Yeah, and and <laughs> and people will also tell us that well, kind of a uh, from the first album it has been downhill to them, and that's fair enough. Um, but on the other hand. Uh, uh, the British bands were out there. There was the kind of a debut album of Paradise Lost, uh, had some really nice heaviness to it. Mm. Uh, the really first uh, releases of My Dying Bride had really good uh, weight to them as well. Uh, first uh, releases of Anathema, uh, similarly. So, so there was the kind of a British wipe of uh, Extreme Doom. Uh, of course, yeah. And at that time, Esoteric was starting. So, so kind of whereas these uh, mentioned bands like Anathema and, and Paradise Lost then took their music into a lighter direction, and then there was Esoteric who did the complete opposite. So kind of creating your very own style and, and making it completely extreme. Okay. I don't think I heard that. Uh, you really should. Okay. So, so kind of... Um, Are we talking late 80s now? Uh, early 90s uh, around that time I can't really tell I think esoteric started uh, on the side of the ages but we need to check mm. but kind of um, uh, what's happening here this is a kind of therapy session where Mr. Thomas Erickson is slowly drawn into uh, listening to classic extreme doom mm -hmm. and then you'll slowly become um, a writer depressive extreme <laughs> suicidal doom. <laughs> no, neither of those. We we, we discussed the, this before, but yeah. we'll get back to that in a minute. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, the question being, uh, how did this sort of a thing happen? So, some uh, old wise men in the scene back in the early nineties. Well, those guys were like old guys, so they were maybe like twenty eight. Oh. <laughs> And uh, they were trying to predict what's going to be the next main line of the underground mm. uh, once the brutal death metal thing passes and uh, the green core thing passes. Yeah. And they were predicting oftentimes three things. It could be industrial style metal, it could be black metal, or it could be doom. Mm. Um, and doom as in something in that area. Mm. So uh, not really knowing how wise those old men were back in the time, uh, you would see that kind of a doom kind of things did appear. So there was the British bands that we mentioned. There was a bunch of bands in Finland that started. There were also bands uh, in other countries, but somehow the fact that several ones appeared in Finland around a couple of years, we weren't in touch with each other. We didn't know those other guys. But I would assume that the idea of playing really slow, really heavy stuff uh, in Finland comes from how we are kind of uh, how we have grown up in the country, uh, what kind of um, music we grown up with. When mm. you think of uh, Finlandia by Sibelius, it's kind of a uh, dark in a sense, uh, and when you think of Finnish popular music. Uh, People often wonder why do people write pop in minor scales. So can we like our music uh, to be the, the normal for us is sad for many others. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay, so, fascinating. So then, kind of, a, if you think of uh, what kind of a doom bands appeared from the UK, for example, they are in average a bit different from the ones that appeared from Finland. Yeah. And in that sense, we weren't really alone, uh, kind of going for a slower, slower and heavier style variety of uh, the kind of initial doom. But as said, the inspiration for the style for us still was strongly uh, the slow and heavier parts of death metal because that's what we were into coming into this than the so-called classic doom metal or or other uh, yeah because classic doom metal is uh, is like uh, punk rock fast con- uh, con- if you compare it to what you guys were doing yeah yeah because uh, it's extremely slow yeah and that's so unique that's that why I'm picking at you with this just figure out where it c- came from you know yeah yeah mm. uh, also an interesting thing about kind of the first album being the best is like I said I really really like the debut album of Cathedral. Mm. Uh, I like the early releases of My Dying Bride. And back in 96, or was it early 97, uh, My Dying Bride was on a tour supported by Cathedral and they would come to, come to Helsinki. And um, I went to see them and I was really disappointed in what Cathedral did. Because I liked the part of the first album where they were the furthest away from the kind of uh, doom metal thing, like where you have these um, Black Sabbath riffs and, mm. and, and that, that, that kind of emotion. I didn't like that. I liked the other parts. And since the debut album, uh, they started going into that kind of uh, riffy uh, doom metal thing, yeah. which, which a lot of people appreciate. Uh, but it wasn't. Call it a cliche. Uh, well. If you will. Uh, you can do that, or mm. you can uh, call it proven good stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but still, they did mainly that. And I was really dis- disappointed because I uh, I appreciated the other side of that. Mm. And uh, that might be the reason why people uh, relate like that to debut albums. Like, kind of, uh, you uh, like it somehow, and you imagine that the band is about the things that you find the most interesting about that album yep. and and that happened to me with cathedral so i like that flute thing i like that kind of a uh uh slowness and, and the kind of a it isn't so very heavy it's more like kind of a uh, kind of flowing forward steadily mm. uh, there's a nice emotion to the music mm. uh, but then uh, what they got those guys really wanted to do would be more of, of the riffy thing and um, I guess that happens to many people with many bands, uh, and it, it happened to me with those bands. Yep. Uh, but still, it's it's kind of natural. So when you the only point of reference for the band that you have is a single album, you'll imagine the rest, and then when they do the next one, which isn't into the, that direction, then you are disappointed. Yeah, that's how it is. People are different, and people need to evolve. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So then. Um, this was a kind of a nice sidetrack. Good. Then uh, we can have a drinking pause, I think. Yes. So the debut was out, but the process of kind of figuring out what is the sound of the band was still ongoing. Mm-hmm. So um, around that time, um, I had the bass pedals for the keyboards, but kind of the sound was the same for the keys and the pedals and I started migrating that into a direction where the pedals have a different uh, sound by feel so kind of the keys would be um, maybe more refined and and then uh, the pedals would be kind of more uh, bassy in in a sense Mm -hmm. so uh, and it kind of uh, continued developing that keyboard sound in that direction. The drummer uh, switched from drumsticks to uh, timpani mallets at that point, uh, which changed the feel and and kind of the overall sound of the drums. Okay, so he didn't do that for the first album then? Yeah, if I remember right again, 
I think it was still with sticks on the first album. Okay. Let me think. It might have been that he was using the mallets already. I, I'm not entirely sure, but no. uh, for the first album he was still uh, running a normal de double bass drum set. So he kind of altered that so that there was, um, the second bass drum became the gong bass drum, which was, was basically a third tom. Uh, yeah, because uh, I can't imagine you guys needing two bass drums. <laughs> uh, do, 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 yeah, do. <laughs> uh, but, but, but actually you can hear the double bass drums on the first album. Really? Uh, in the beginning uh, of the song Powering, it starts with a double bass drum beat. How fast is that, not, basically? Not so very fast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so there was no need for that, so he went for a single bass drum setup, and that second bass drum being the gong bass, kind of, mm. a, kind of a third tom, turned out to be really useful, so there was that. Yeah. Uh, and, and also that setup affected how he would set up uh, the drum beats in the coming songs. And of course then there was the thing where the guitarist started using two amplifiers so that at times you would have uh, the distorted and the clean sound at the same time. Uh, so, so that was, uh, uh, in a sense, you got a deeper sound from the same amount of people. And with new songs written and uh, those additions or, or kind of refinements into the signature sound, we recorded the second album, uh, Lead and Ether. I think we recorded that in 97. And uh, I would say that album has our signature sound with those kind of uh, modifications, which kind of were just refining what we had already taken on. Uh, so I would say since that album, we have been mainly just refining that sound. Yeah. And um, of course, we've gone further in songwriting and, and we've uh, gone a bit back and forth with many things. But I would say that was the kind of a, the second or third defining moment for a band. So uh, we are playing this slow, heavy funeral march like metal. And this is how we set it up. And uh, on that second album, um, there's a song. The March and the Stream, uh, which we wrote for two years, uh, and it kind of also became a definition of the style and the sound. So it was kind of a really simple, uh, really heavy, and and then uh, utilizing all of those mentioned components of the sound. So in the beginning, um, at that stage, the gong bass drum. The drummer had it uh, on the left side and the toms were on the right side. Yeah. So playing that beat for that marching song, he would kind of be leaning uh, to the left uh, to strike uh, the gong bass every other time and then leaning to the right, uh, strike both of the toms on the other time. So it kind of, uh, when it's quite slow, and you play it uh, so that you are really leaving the song emotionally. Mm. So the recording engineer in the um, uh, studio, where we are sound checking for the drums, and the drummer was playing that, he kind of grabbed us uh, from the sofa and uh, was like, "Hey guys, come and see this. This actually looks very, very cool. Just seeing the drummer play that beat. So it kind of even that side." Uh, how you move when you play the music with the kind of different setup and, and different uh, thinking of what is the drum kit in this song. Uh, that it kind of uh, evolved into something really that felt natural and, and right for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also in that song, uh, for example, there's the middle section without keyboards. Uh, where you can hear the clean and the distorted uh, guitar at the same time. Mm. And, and also, uh, when you do it with 
double amplifiers we've done that live on every show as well yeah again so we were there in the late 90s uh releasing the second album there was still practically little internet existing uh this album comes out uh we weren't doing any live shows at that point yet uh and uh, well there was a small audience for the band uh, really small uh loyal following kind of thing yeah but then again uh, as we weren't doing any shows um we weren't really in touch with the people who appreciated the music so so there was um, occasionally uh interviews um and all of that but it was mainly us writing more music and kind of refining what we actually really wanted and um uh, still the american label right still uh, the american label and um, and they had like a global distribution network um somewhat yes but um it was still very different so kind of a if you wanted to find the album uh in every record store in a random european country for example uh that wouldn't be diff- difficult so it was really really small scale mm. stuff yeah. uh which was fine in a in a sense that um we didn't have any pressure in you need to do this many albums and, and you need to sell this many albums no. so it was just kind of a do an album and we'll release it and, yeah. and we did that mm. so uh also we did release um kind of a, the deal we made with red stream was that we would release a mini cd uh, and related to the album and then the album uh, and we would do two of those combinations and the first one uh was called uh ether and then there was the legion ether album so they were kind of a adaptations of uh the songs mm. uh, on the mini cd uh, then after the second album we wrote a single song of 27 minutes uh called aes uh and released and recorded that so it was kind of a the thing was we were thinking like why would we do why are we doing songs uh and we thought like let's just uh do something a piece that we think is uh reasonable to listen at one go reasonable to play at one go Mm. and we did that so for the first two albums, we had help for the covers and the visual side from uh, the mentioned Jukka Korpihete. Mm. Uh, for the third one, um, well, not, not the third album, but the AE's mini CD, which wasn't kind of a, a part of that original plan of making mini CD full album pairs, uh, we had a, a local friend called Thomas Leitinen uh, create the cover for that. And, and there was some kind of a fresh ideas there. So um, the cover itself was uh transparent and it w- would look different depending on what was the kind of angle you happened to have the cd under it okay so so that, that was um, a nice idea back in the day and, and then we kind of came back full circle in 2021 when thomas did the cover for companion album yes anyway uh so we did that uh was all, was the early albums on vinyl as well? By the way, no, never. only CDs because uh, yeah, this was the nineties and uh, yeah, 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 and and vinyl was the old uh, bad thing that we everyone wanted to get rid of. Yeah, so so that was little did I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, hmm? get it. Yeah, and also technically, when you think of those early albums, so um, the first one we recorded on analog tape because digital wasn't available. Hmm. The second one we recorded on ADAT because that was what you did in uh, late 90s. So kind of a, your average project studio would have ADATs in there. And then the third one uh, called Pharmacon, if I remember right, we recorded that in 2000, 2002, I believe. Hmm. So for that one we uh recorded that on tape but then uh, it was partially mixed uh in analog and partially uh on a digital side 
with a technique that wasn't really flawless. So kind of a, the recording engineer would kind of a, mix a section of the song and then get it to the digital side and then another section. So sometimes uh, it would be difficult to match the part you did yesterday to the part you are doing today. So it, oh. it, it, it was really kind of at that point, uh, computers were not really uh, easily powerful enough to mix a song. Can you imagine? Yep. Uh, yeah, so so that was technically the thing. But anyway, uh, we wrote again new songs and uh, after that one song piece and started working on the third album, uh, which would be called Pharmacon. Um, for me personally, uh, that was the most difficult album. But before going there, there's something um, remarkable that happened, which was that we started making or doing live shows again. Okay. That was in 2001. So there was a uh, gig organizer from Turku called Jussi Helenius who would call me up. He got my number from somewhere and he would call me up regularly saying, hey, how about we do a skepticism show? And I was in the line of thinking that, well, this kind of music wouldn't work live. But the guy kept calling me and then eventually I thought that, well, and, and talked to the others and we thought, well, let, let's try it. And we went to uh, Turku and played in January 2001. And then we continued the Turku tour uh, by playing again in January 2002. Uh, on the second show, we had uh, Patrick McCahan, uh, the man running Red Stream, attending the show. Okay, so he flew over here. Yes. That's a special event. Yeah. <laughs> Skepticism on stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the second time. Uh, it wasn't the second time ever because we had played in the uh, early 90s, uh, the kind of uh, before the introduction of the organ. But those were the first uh, shows where we had the signature sound yeah. pres present. And only in Finland this far. Yeah. Yep. So then uh, we played those shows. Uh, on the second show, uh, our singer was wearing the tailcoat. On the first one, he had kind of a robe kind of a thing going on. We were still kind of thinking, of how do we do live? Yep. But for the second one, uh, we got the tailcoat and he's worn that very tailcoat on every show since that, except for one. It still fits. Um, That's good. Well, um, <laughs> of course, you need to know that uh, you can adapt clothing. Yep. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, I am wearing the same coat uh, that I've had for every show. Yeah. So far, I'm wearing uh, otherwise the same garments. So, so that happens. Um, I did see you guys live once. I went yeah. to the London show you did, obviously, at the FinFest. And uh, yeah. looks like a funeral. Yeah. In a way, you know? Yes, and there's kind of a... I would say there's a strong visual component um, to the music. Um, I could kind of actually refer to what happened yesterday. So yesterday we were at the lakeside with Mr. Eriksson mm -hmm. uh, and um, some other people and we were looking at uh, the dusk, the sun setting uh, into the west uh, at the end of a lake. And, and Thomas said, looking at that, that there was the same kind of uh, feel to that sunset as there was to the song Sign of a Storm. Yep. So in a sense, I would say uh, some music uh, might be less so, but uh, for us there has been a strong visual side to it at all times. So for example, we uh, spent quite a bunch of energy in thinking how do you visualize the cover of the first album and, and kind of how do you do the second and uh, what kind of things do you want there? And we were taking a lot of uh, photos at the time. What is the picture on the first album, by the way? I don't remember what that was, uh, the it, cover. Uh, it is actually uh, a crow. A bird? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, people mistake that for a flame easily, but yeah, I think I, I believe I thought it was like a flame thing. Yeah, yeah, but it is actually a crow. Okay, uh, and um, 
uh, the fact that it isn't clearly a crow isn't a coincidence. So kind of it's the uh, photo is shot in a really sensitive film, which makes it kind of soft and grainy, mm-hmm. and and that's why it looks like that. Yeah. So so kind of we wanted it to be. Leave it a bit to the ma- imagination as well, I suppose. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and then the thing in the background it looks a bit like a, a sunset, which it isn't, but anyway. Yeah. So so kind of we really wanted to those get those things in there. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was planned out then. Yes. Yes. No, yeah. no coincidences. <laughs> no, but that's good. Uh, well, of course there are coincidences in, in a kind of when you, when you are shooting something on uh, old school film. You uh, don't know how the outcome will be. Yeah, obviously, uh, before it happens. Then for the second album, yeah. um, we are still working closely with Jukka Korpiheta, so we uh, had a band member photos taken of everyone uh, with the same technique we took the cover of the first album. Mm. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Korpi had made a painting uh, that is featured on the cover of the second album. The painting is currently on the wall of my home studio. Uh, so That's the original, I suppose. That is the very original one. Mm. And, um, well, uh, th- there's a section of that in the cover of Lead and Ether album, and then there are sections of that that make up the cover of the ether um mini cd it's beautiful it is i like it yeah and kind of uh i've been looking at that for <laughs> 30 years and i still discover new things in it when i look at it yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's a good symbol yeah so uh kind of that painting is just black and white when you think of how a skepticism show looks like, we are dressed in black and white, uh, and we are mainly having darkness and white light. Yes. So, so it is very black and white, and um, that it feels, uh, in a sense, like a funeral. Um, that is kind of how do we build the atmosphere there. I'm just looking at the covers uh, while you're talking here. Yep. Fascinating. You are clearly trying to find the crawl from the... Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. So... I can see it. That's the beak, right? Yeah, that's the beak. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Huh. Because you mentioned uh, what I told you about the sunset we watched. And... um, when I discovered uh, skepticism and heard that track, at the same time I was kind of fumbling around. I don't know if if it was Google Maps or whatever. It was uh, probably just Wikipedia. I was like uh, just searching around uh, Russia and rural sites on our planet, and I found a photo from a Russian tundra with a snow-covered uh, plane and that kind of sunset. Uh, and I, I watched that at the same time. I listened to that snippet of the song. So that's why it built this image for me, obviously. And then I saw your cover here. And it's uh, kind of similar, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Then that's the one. Yeah. The second one, was it? Yeah, the second one is uh, there's kind of a dark green velvet uh, in the background. Mm. And there is a section of the painting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was that. So we started going back to live shows. Mm-hmm. Then around uh, the turn of the century, uh, internet appeared, and the people who are into extreme doom started finding each other. So kind of a there would be places where you could discuss stuff like, would it be great to see? skepticism live uh, would I like to see say pantheist live and uh, eventually uh, we created the third album like I said it was the most difficult for me um, in a sense kind of we were uh, again experimenting with things like kind of what kind of direction should the music take should we make it more complex should we make it even kind of a less complex and um, writing the lyrics for that album was kind of for me 
interesting experience kind of I wanted to my opinion was to simplify the music as much as we can mm. uh, and I also wanted to simplify the lyrics to a point where I didn't want to write lyrics okay uh, so instrumental uh, album uh, it, it didn't become that no. uh, but but when you think of um, there are songs on Pharmacon the lyrics of which are as long as a verse on a song on a, on the companion album so so kind of <laughs> yeah uh, like i said uh, when i said difficult uh it was uh it was hard for me uh as a band member to decide what did i really actually want uh and then there was this uh, i mentioned how we technically made that album it wasn't it's, it was quite cumbersome uh, on the other hand uh for the mini album or mini cd for that album we borrowed and brought in a really big organ harmonium in the studio and, and that sounds quite interesting uh, we made a version of one of the songs on the album on the mini cd where i played that organ harmonium and, and i really liked that hmm. um, the sound is, is kind of uh, rotten in a in a great way okay yeah, yeah. and uh, then we released that album and um because uh, there was a kind of a increasing interest or at least people who were into that style of music at that time started finding each other. There would be um, even small festivals dedicated to it. Mm-hmm. And, and we got in touch with these people, uh, especially people from the band Pantheist. And uh, uh, they organized a small tour uh, where we went to uh, a couple of countries and dropped by it. I think it was the Dutch Doom Days uh, festival, uh, one day festival there home uh, that, that we attended and uh, then kind of we could find the people who really appreciated the music. Hmm. Uh, that was around uh, the time when that Pharmacom album was released. So kind of um, we got to see that uh, there are people who really care for this kind of uh, 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 music and the uh, kind of the atmosphere that it creates, and then, uh, in a sense, it was kind of had we uh, remained as a studio band and making albums and releasing them and never getting to meet those people and and having them look you in the eye and, and, and tell you what they felt about the show. It probably might have led to us kind of uh, running out of motivation at some point. So in a sense, I think it was really important for the band to get to kind of expose that thing more to people. Mm-hmm. And um, how did it feel being you, such a call it a hidden underground phenomenon for so long, and then realizing that you actually had. Uh, dedicated listeners it was surprising in a sense because it had been so silent uh, uh, in the late 90s on the other hand uh, kind of people are eager to find silver linings in things Uh, and kind of for me uh, I felt that it was great uh, that there were some people who were really really into the stuff and kind of really uh, uh, appreciated the good qualities of the music and, and kind of uh, the atmosphere. So to find those some really dedicated people instead of having a lot of people mildly interested sounded good because of course I've personally always taken the music and the lyrics very seriously. So kind of it's kind of I think of it almost as if uh, the question was if there was only one song you could still write and one set of lyrics you could still write, what would it be? Mm. So, so kind of, uh, I've always wanted uh, the songs to kind of represent something that's meaningful and interesting or, or meaningful and important to me. So in that sense, that someone appreciates something uh, that you <laughs> kind of... Uh, bleed your heart into mm. uh, it's really important absolutely 
Yeah. So then, uh, in that sense, I think it was uh, important to get to see and experience that. Uh, probably if we only remained as a studio band, uh, it would have become maybe too slow for everyone eventually. But the uh, funny question, uh, what about the fans? What kind of people were they? W were they kind of goths or what What kind of people did you, was it regular people from the street that uh, happened to get into that sound and that music or? Uh, I wouldn't say there's a single archetype no? of the fan. So there would be kind of surprising uh, kind of a regular people Uh, from the street, like a, a person who would l look more like your average family dad mm -hmm. could be in the audience. Or there could be that uh, gothic lady uh, in a kind of a... Uh, black lipstick and black uh, nail polish and uh, uh, yeah, the, and, and, the and, coat and, and everything. And uh, Yeah, that sort of thing. Or, uh, or kind of a, um, even a uh, evening dress kind of really kind of... Uh, um, complex looking uh, clothing mm. uh, there would be those uh, kind of um, uh, metal heads as well uh, there's even sometimes slow motion moshing going on but, but I would say if you saw just an, an, a picture of the crowd you couldn't really tell whether that's a metal crowd or nope. or, or some other music style crowd so um, Somehow I'd say probably, well, the audience is really worried. So so the, it isn't a sing, just a single or a couple kinds of people that come there. Hmm. It's such a um, unique uh, style of music. And it's hmm. funny how uh, all kinds of people can actually relate to it. Yeah. For being as such a niche uh, band. Yeah, yeah. And kind of a. Uh, this is again sidetrack, but let's go on the sidetrack. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, releasing the latest album, Companion, in two, 2021, uh, I got to think of things a lot because there was the pandemic and it was our 30th anniversary, our anniversary year. Mm. Yeah. And I did a bunch of interviews and, and thought of things so kind of i realized that it is actually really important to get feedback on your music from mm. people um, oftentimes people say such things like the only important thing is that you are happy with the music yourself and you write the music for yourself and so forth mm -hmm. uh, which is of course a strong argument but on the other hand if that were true you could end up repeating yourself uh, in a boring way, just doing the same thing over and over again and being kind of a happy tapping yourself on the shoulder on that mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of uh, not realizing your full potential uh, as a writer and as an, as an artist. So in that sense, uh, for me, it has been really important uh, to encounter people who either dislike the music or like the music And after shows, when people come to us and, and tell what the music meant to them, it's kind of having those stories where, where people say kind of that having this music with me has uh, made things easier or more, more difficult or, uh, or kind of that they it had a strong emotional impact to that person. Mm -hmm. uh, that feedback is important to me because um, if that never happened, if if people would be like, well, it's okay music. I, I, I listen to it while cooking. Mm. Uh, that would be okay, but that wouldn't be what I want from the music. No. So personally, um, what I think of myself is that if I started repeating uh, the same old thing and, and doing boring, irrelevant stuff, I probably wouldn't notice that myself. So when I think of the previous album, Companion, uh, it was well received. Uh, I was really happy about that. The previous album before that, uh, Ordeal, 
that was less well uh, received, but I was equally happy with that album. So, so kind of in that sense, uh, meeting people, hearing their opinions on the music, be it uh, positive or negative, I think it's important just to kind of uh, uh, to have some uh, kind of interaction, you know? in, interaction yeah. and, and realization of kind of how the thing that you think is natural to you is actually relating to other people. So uh, I think it's important and kind of going to shows, getting the feedback uh, and kind of even, of course, it oftentimes so goes that people who didn't like it um, won't say anything. But the people who did may say something. Mm. Uh, but uh, also sentences such as uh, it kind of uh, it made me feel something I've never felt before. Uh, kind of getting those really strong emotional reactions from people, uh, kind of even if they are kind of random as well, and also might be that uh, if people meet you in person, they may feel that it's. Um, it's polite to say something like that, mm. but but anyway, getting that feedback at times is is kind of uh, reassuring to hear that uh, what we felt uh, was our main thing originally is yeah. somewhat still there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So where where were we before this sidetrack? I think we were uh, somewhere between the third album, Pharmacon, and what happened next. Yes. So, as I said, the second album, Lead and Aether, was kind of a, maybe the second defining moment for the band. So kind of a, uh, the first one being uh, the demo where we uh, came to the kind of final lineup. Mm. Uh, and then we kind of did the debut album in between and then we refined that uh, our signature sound to what it is. Um, there uh, on the second album. Then the third album, to me, that was us trying how far into simplifying and kind of making things experimental we want to take it. Mm -hmm. And for me it was, uh, that was the furthest. And if you think of the third album, uh, Pharmacon, and the fourth al album, Alloy, you could say that uh, the fourth album is more rock and roll in a sense. Okay. That it's the songs are more compact and there's less of that kind of drone like, post rock like uh, feel to it. Uh, on Pharmacon, we even made that untitled song, which we really kind of uh, believed in strongly, where the drummer only plays the gong bass drum. And it, it's kind of like a ritual like thing. Mm. It is really really cool in a sense but kind of uh, having exhausted that path kind of we can do really kind of a ritualistic uh, manic sounding things then for the next album we just wrote straightforward strong heavy songs mm. so in a sense I would even say that 2008 fourth album Alloy was a defining moment again. So kind of we went towards the direction of being experimental and, and kind of um, uh, ritualistic mm. in a sense. But then we thought, well, this is far enough. Well, we didn't actually think so. We just kind of continue writing more music. And then we kind of made a turn there uh, where we ended up uh, with more straightforward songs. Uh, we made the second and third album pretty much in the same studio that wasn't really metal uh, oriented. Uh, for the fourth one, uh, we went to a metal oriented uh, studio, which can be heard of kind of how is the guitar sound built and, and so forth. Um, with the keyboards, uh, we started using the distortion uh, and driving that uh, the bass pedals uh, through the distortion and a bass amp uh, mm. that we've used ever since and, and those sort of things. But for me, that thing there was that kind of we got back into more structured songwriting. Uh, we got the uh, church organ with distorted guitar sound 
into the form it still currently is and um, also the release of that uh, album uh, was followed by a small European tour with uh, Pantheistan Office. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I'm saying Alloy was a defining moment as well is that looking back, what could have happened after Pharmacon would have been that we could have gone entirely into an experimental direction where we just kind of uh, improvise songs together and record that. Uh, but that wouldn't feel natural to me uh, so uh, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm happy about that we went back to the kind of more straightforward songs like in the on the debut album instead of that kind of a more uh, free form uh, approach and also I think what could have happened since the third album is that we could have lost motivation as a whole we could have ended the band mm-hmm. uh, but we didn't we wrote a new album we released that through Redstream, and that was probably the last album that they released. So, kind of, our debut was their first, the fourth album was the last, and in between there were what? 15 years or so? 18, I think. Okay, yeah. That's a long partnership. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, no, it was actually. 95, 2008. No, that's only 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's a long, long partnership, and, and there was a lot of upsides to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, yeah, uh, we toured with the Alloy album. I'm still happy with how that album turned out. Is that your only tour, by the way? Uh, we did one after, or, or around the release of Pharmacon. And then the second one with the Alloy album, so okay. two tours, two tours, uh, and, and both were with um, with Pantheist. So that's like a funeral uh, poster, then. Uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. But what countries did you visit? Uh, it was um, uh, Germany, Belgium. We went to Austria on either of those, uh, Czech Republic on both, mm-hmm. and so forth. And um, uh, the trip. Czech Republic shows in the Black Pest uh, Club in Prague were really, really nice. Uh, the crowd was really intense there. The German shows were also really good. Um, and um, I don't remember uh, all of the places off the top of my head, but uh, those were kind of a roughly a week and a half uh, driving around mm. uh, Central Europe. Uh, really, really uh, good trips. Uh, well, of course, exhausting, but good. Yes, I know. <laughs> Little sleep and everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, in a sense, uh, maybe the third defining moment, at least from my point of view, for the band uh, was the Alloy album. After that, we did... Uh, well, in our scale, uh, quite a lot of um, shows. Well, that means uh, five-ish a year or something like that. And we continued writing more music. So, Alloy was released in 2008. And then for the next seven years, we worked on new music. We had this idea of uh, kind of reverse of my initial idea of this kind of music not working in a live situation uh, I reversed my opinion to being the music as is at its best in a live situation so then we thought uh, how about uh, we will record the next album live yep. only new songs do it live in front of a live audience, uh, show the DVD at the same time, and try to capture some of that, the band being at its best live idea into that. So we did. So we recorded the Ordeal album uh, live in front of an audience in 2015 in, in January. Mm. And um, 
the idea there was that we'll play it live uh, and we'll kind of mix the live tracks in the studio later, but we won't add any overdubs or anything like that. Oh, so uh, honest raw sound. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, on the other albums, we've had um, overdubs recorded for the guitar. Uh, but for this one, we got a session guitarist to play the second guitar. Oh. So it would be all live, so we w- wouldn't be adding anything afterwards. Uh, so we did that. And um, songwriting-wise, um, some of our strongest songs ever are on that album. Like, for example, for me personally, uh, the song March Incomplete. If I was the dictator of the band who would decide what kind of music we play, we would be... Uh, making pretty much only songs like that so yeah. there's there's kind of uh the drum beat uh the bass pedals and clean guitar with the vocals and then uh when you start making it thicker you do but uh, it's just kind of a the basic thing is simple uh bass pedals drums uh clean guitar i'm, I'm and it's uh it's a marching song it's slow it's heavy uh, that would define <laughs> a genre for me mm. and, and then of course there's um, uh, the closing music which is describing how you feel in the coffin when your uh, friends are burying you so it's kind of imagining that uh, and, and kind of uh, the sounds and, and tones we are making to support that uh, it's a really strong thing to play and, and think of. And uh, we oftentimes uh, end shows with that. So kind of composition-wise, uh, we had really strong material there. But somehow somehow what happened there perhaps was that the thought being that the band, band would be the strongest live, we didn't somehow pull it through completely so that kind of for example the fact that i will well i believe that that song material is is really strong still it didn't really uh, come across to people as such so so in in a sense i'm happy that we did it it was a kind of a bold move to do a live album really like that uh but then uh the response to that um in the sense of uh, kind of um, what people said and and what uh, what was the result after that um, wasn't as uh, as strong as it was, for example, in the case of Companion. On the other hand, uh, what was good was that after the ordeal album, uh, we did even more shows in our scale than before. So it was kind of a, uh, some years it would be. 10 or 15 shows even and and that was nice uh, we, we got to uh, new kinds of festivals and uh, so some of them would be kind of doom oriented and, and some of them would be more rock oriented and, and whatnot mm-hmm. and um, that was nice uh, the session guitarist uh, played shows with us for the next year or so and after that we just kind of went back to our normal four piece operation and then, at that point, we were uh, getting close to our 30th anniversary. The band was uh, originally uh, formed in 91. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of, I think the uh, forming members, the guitarist and the drummers, started playing together even a couple of years earlier. But... We are kind of um, considering uh, the formation of the band to be in 91 so that uh, the singer was the last one to join uh, towards the end of the year. I joined earlier in 91 and, and so forth. So, so we got these people together who are still in the band that happened in 91. So in 2021, we... Turned, that's respectable. Uh, that's yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of... What I said in the beginning is that kind of they were trying to find people who would stick around. 
Yeah. Uh, and that kind of happened. Another thing that impresses the shit out of me is that you guys, honestly, you don't have a massive following. Mm -hmm. And you have your own really strange niche kind of sound going on, but you're still doing it mm -hmm. 30 years on, the same people. Yeah. To me, that is impressive and it really shines of dedication and yeah. trueness. <laughs> you're staying true to what you are doing. Yeah. And uh, how I describe this oftentimes is that being, well, uh, uh, as you might imagine, I've never played in any other band. I don't intend to play in another band later. So for me, this has been uh, a lifestyle in a sense mm -hmm. that kind of uh, some people call uh, hiking and whatnot. I write metal with my friends. Oh, uh, that's again a bit an overstatement. I write metal in the band, so kind of, of course, I've known these people, my bandmates, for a long time, uh, and it has been so close that uh, labeling them as friends would be wrong. They're more like brothers, and yeah. uh, you have different kind of arguments with the, with a brother than you have with a friend. So, so there's that. So, I've thought of that a lot as well. So, kind of, why and how have we done? this mm -hmm. and one thing there that helped is actually that we didn't have too much success if we did we would easily end up in a situation like well there would be a three month tour uh, of the US what do you mean you can't take time off from your work what do you mean you can't leave your children for three months or whatnot and you probably would, if you had success early on, I suppose you you would be starting to chase the rabbit, you know. Could be, could be. And then you will lose touch of what you have built today. Mm -hmm. That could have happened, but mm. uh, uh, the fortunate thing about not being too successful is that you don't need to get into those discussions. No. Uh, we don't need to discuss whether everyone can make an American tour because there's none. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and kind of uh, in a sense, when you are uh, not too successful, you don't need to get into those discussions where uh, where everyone is actually aligned on what you want from the band financially. Uh, you can just solely focus on what you want from the band artistically, in a sense. And, and of course, uh, I'm not of that variety, like uh, uh, some people kind of take the art side of things really seriously. Like I even heard one uh, artist say that they think they sacrifice their life on the altar of art. And that's just uh, a bit too much to state for me. Uh, kind of, um, for me, the thing is that everyone in the band has their own ambition on their own uh, area of the band. Uh, so kind of you can label that as artistic ambition or just kind of a, a workman's ambition in a sense that I'm doing this thing, I'm playing this instrument and I want to make it sound and, and I want to make it have an impact that's meaningful. Mm. So, so we've had that. So everyone, in a way, has taken the band seriously in a sense that it doesn't need to be successful, but it needs to be something you can be proud of. Yeah. Uh, also, something that turned up um, in some of the interviews we had last year is that kind of, for example, a singer uh, is the kind of person when he gets to perform in front of a crowd, it feels like he's more himself than ever elsewhere. So imagine that person not being in a band. So there is a kind of a statue-like uh, funeral figure in you that never gets used. Mm -hmm. so, so in a sense, we were lucky enough to find these people 30 years ago who would uh, nearly enough share the same ambition level 
uh, for the band that we would stick together. And and I said, uh, kind of some bands are friends and they just enjoy playing together and being together. For us, it isn't always so peaceful because, as I said, we have our own ambitions, and uh, and well, we have our brotherly disputes on on how to do things and and, and what to do. But still, uh, I've said that this for me is a lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, and I hope we get to keep this lifestyle going. Uh, the rough idea is that until the first one dies or Depending on who's the first one, well, it could be also the second one. Is he the re- replaceable one? <laughs> uh, well, uh, what is certain is that most probably no one will be replaced. No. But if it so happens that the guitarist and the singer go first, we could still probably play duo with the drummer. Hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, kind of. I like the romance in that. It's good. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and and the thing is that kind of I'm looking back. I'm I'm really happy that we have practically by coincidence and without planning it ahead achieved uh, just the right amount of success to keep the band going. Mm-hmm. And and kind of for myself, I've even made conscious choices of kind of a, for me the important thing is that the band keeps moving, that we don't stop, that we keep writing songs, that we keep making albums, because that keeps the band going. Mm. And and that's kind of a loop of a thought. So then, after uh, the Alloy album, uh, we were getting close to the 30th anniversary. Yes. And and we, on purpose, uh, aimed the companion album to be released in 2021 because of that. Uh, and we were pretty much... Uh, complete with the compositions and, and oftentimes uh, when we set a artificial deadline for ourselves, like we need to be in the studio uh, in uh, towards the end of 2020, mm. then you kind of uh, get uh, to finishing up the songs and all that. And uh, we did that uh, again, having had the experience of going into a established studio that has produced uh, good sounding metal. We continued on that uh, after doing the live thing in between. That was a good choice and also I would say how the companion album turned out was quite remarkable for us in a sense that again we were doing uh, our usual thing, release an album, write six new songs, release the next album. Uh, how we work on that is that uh, there are no spare songs. We work on a song until we are happy with that and we work on more songs until we have six and that's an album. Mm-hmm. So uh, we worked on those six songs. Uh, we recorded them. Uh, we kind of found a couple of new angles to our sound but nothing major. It's still a refinement of the '97 album, second album. Um, but the feedback we got from the album, the reception it got, was really um, kind of a uh, positive. Isn't the correct word for this? It was kind of a. It, it wasn't overwhelming in a way, but uh, a lot of people appreciated the things that we did there mm. and that was really um, reassuring to hear again like I said earlier it's kind of a it would be really easy to start repeating yourself and, and whatnot or to try experimenting so much that you would lose uh, what's the essence of the music again it might be different for different people for but for us to be you know uh, we've touched upon the um, concept of true a couple of times in the uh, past couple of days. Yeah. For me, what is true is that you might easily get into uh, a line of thinking like, okay, we are considered to be a funeral doom band. How about we do a funeral doom that people would expect us to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, one could do that. Uh, on the other hand, 
if you try to please some actual or uh, kind of a, a kind of audience that you think there is, that mm. you imagine there is, if you start kind of a, a creating a product for a need that either does or does not exist, uh, you would end up um, in a situation where you might uh, end up playing a role of a band instead of being a band. Mm. Uh, playing a role of a uh, artist in a genre instead of writing what is meaningful to you. And this all kind of sounds like a cliche that you really need to do what you need to do um, to be honest with yourself. And we did that uh, with the companion album and when we released the first the opening track, Color, uh, some people were surprised like, well, this sounds fast. This sounds like uh, melodic death metal. This doesn't sound like funeral doom. But on the other hand, we could have slowed that down. But we figured that the whole the tempo of that song is formed around what is the best tempo for the guitar part of the second riff like. If you slow that down too much, uh, it loses some of its power. So that the music defined how we perform it mm. uh, and kind of uh, that is the kind of a uh, decision I think we did right from my perspective like should we try to be something that we are able to be or should we just do the best music we can and see what happens and I think we will follow the latter route uh, as we have so far so basically uh, for me, it would be kind of a, a form of death, death as a band hmm. to start to kind of a, to start to play a role of a funeral doom band hmm. or, or any genre for any artist. So uh, eventually, the next album will again contain music that we felt comfortable with writing between now and the release of that album. Mm. Uh, so, in a sense, we did that. We wrote music that we were happy with, we were comfortable with, and released that, and, and people appreciated that. Uh, I was personally really happy about that as well. And um, on the album, we had different kind of things. Uh, we had a song based heavily on a dream the drummer had, uh, the lyrics of Kalla uh, being based on something the guitarist experienced. Uh, the lyrics of the intertwined uh, being heavily based on what I experienced in my life. Um, so kind of, uh, it was honestly the kind of music uh, we wanted to make. Uh, it was about experiences that we got without uh, glorifying them in any way, but just kind of processing them on a conceptual level. And that, that was uh, a very honest album to me, and in that sense, true. Hmm. Then whether that is a true funeral doom, uh, I have no idea. But it's true music by us as a band. And I'm kind of happy with that. If someone likes that, fine. If mm. someone doesn't, that's equally fine. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at least I can say I didn't try to be someone else creating it. To me, that is true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you were working, let's say, uh, on pop and you wanted to have make a living out of the music and, and you would be working on the music more in the lines of uh, being a product. That, that is completely fine. I have nothing against that approach. But still, um, for myself being a person doing this as a lifestyle, uh, trueness is different and it would be like I've described. So kind yeah, of, perfectly. Uh, yeah, well uh, like kind of um, do what you actually uh, can stand behind. Yep. And, and I fully appreciate that not everyone needs to do it like that, but if you are doing it 
as a lifestyle as we are. Uh, I think that is a good approach. Mm-hmm. So uh, we need to touch upon one thing, obviously, since we are gathered here. You told me now uh, that you have never played in a, on a, another band. You will probably never play in yet another band. Mm-hmm. But you did your first guest appearance. How did you? <laughs> how did you experience that thing? Yeah. Uh, again, kind of uh, going back to my statement. Uh, it's unlikely that if something happened to skepticism that I would seek another band to join. Mm. On the other hand, uh, there are some things in the air. I told you earlier that uh, kind of even if I've been in the band for 30 years, I haven't written much music myself nope. until recently. So I started practically uh, writing songs of my own uh, from start to finish, maybe last year or, or it might have been 20 or 21 mm. so i might release some of that i might cooperate on that with someone but anyway i have done a guest appearance on an album once so far mm. and that was uh, a norwegian black metal band called mock mm-hmm. uh, it so happened that i got an email one day uh, from this man uh, in Norway who wanted a church or pipe organ part on his album. I've never heard of that band before. So then I figured I need to find out what is this music about. I of course knew uh, uh, Norwegian black metal. Uh, the Dark Throne albums were really influential at that time and I would even say it's um, kind of a to uh, go to metal school and understand what metal is you need to listen to those albums and and you need to know your Metallica and you need to know your battery mm-hmm. and so forth uh, so I knew what true Norwegian black metal is and then I listened to Mork and I told Mr. Eriksen that I found uh, the music insightful and interesting and I said that because I thought so. So so basically um, had I found the music to be kind of uh, boring and repetitive and uh, and whatnot uh, I would probably not have done this but on the other hand I, I did find it insightful and I said well I'm interested let's do it. Mm-hmm. So then, uh, after some time, uh, well, uh, between that, uh, myself saying that let's do it, and it happening, uh, we had the show in London, in the FinFest, and Thomas attended that, and we had a dinner, and, and discussed kind of uh, what the part should be like. And then, uh, a bit later, uh, Thomas sent me uh, the part and the draft of what it could be like, and um, I had a clear idea on how to do that. Mm. So I, I was working with a very specific uh, setup on instruments and whatnot. I had um, uh, my computer that I've um, done recordings and, and kind of a partial compositions on and all that. But the whole thing uh, turned out to be technically extremely painful. <laughs> so kind of a, between the uh, phase where Thomas sent me the part and uh, the day I sent him the final, final uh, audio tracks uh, for example uh, the laptop I had been using as my main uh, music creation laptop uh, had ended up in a situation where you couldn't uh, start it up again yeah. uh, I was working with a specific um, uh, church organ simulation software that I wanted to use because somehow when you think of a uh, church organ, you think of the kind of, a, for example, romantic era organs from the Central Europe, uh, they have a really kind of a edgy and flashy sound in a way. Uh, that kind of a, that you would uh, 
connect in your head into kind of what church and organ sounds like. But if you go to your average Finnish church, uh, you'll have a organ built by uh, probably a Finnish company that is sounding softer and uh, kind of a I don't know how to describe that, but it, the sound isn't so kind of. It's almost uh, when you compare like uh, the modern high gain metal guitar tone to that that you had in the 90s where you just have a distortion pedal uh, on an older tube amp mm. when the sound is rounder and softer and, and not so kind of edgy and there's and not crispy so... Crispy and stuff. Yeah, crispy and it, it's, mm. it's kind of like you are turning down the tone yep. uh, pot on your guitar. Yes. So the Finnish church organs sound a bit like that and that uh, organ simulator software I wanted to use uh, had that sound to it. So I wanted to play that on the Mog album. Yep. Uh, I had been using that for 10-ish years, but then when I was working on the bit, it started crashing on me. So uh, I would work on, on the part for uh, 10 minutes, uh, get it running, get a, got a couple of more ideas in, and then it would crash and delete all of the uh, presets, uh, presets right? I, yeah. I, I made. <laughs> so luckily, uh, the developer of that software then uh, well, I reported that problem, they made a fix, uh, we got the fixed. But kind of thinking of uh, a simple thing, a couple of minutes of organ, if Thomas would ask me to do that again, uh, right now uh, I could get him into the plane tomorrow, flying back to Norway with the finished part uh, mm. in his pocket. Yeah. But then this took us, uh, well, well, this took me uh, months, on the other hand, the silver lining of that was that I, on top of uh, finishing up the part for Thomas, uh, I realized that I really need to work on uh, the setup I work with. And uh, as I figured that out, uh, I actually, uh, since those days, now have a full-fledged home studio where it's comfortable to work on music. So, in a sense, uh, all that pain was um, useful pain yeah uh, the actual part itself so uh, what did what did you feel about the part by the way when you heard it for the first time kind of uh, you told me that uh, it's kind of a, you created something that feels like funeral doom to you hmm. um, and it does have, have to feel it's of course it, it's a bit on the fast side, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, then, and then if you think of uh, how you mix it, uh, of course the organ should be louder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, no, it... This uh, is for the remix and the remaster version uh, in, no, no. in 20 years. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a... If it were skepticism, it would be like that. But of, of course, it's it's your song, it's your album. And the uh, thing is that that is as much funeral doom Mork could go. Mm, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? And yeah. still being the black, black, black metal thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the actual part, um, I think the way it changes key uh, on the fly there is, is just ingenious. So kind of, um, I said, I don't write so much music myself. Uh, if I had written the whole part, it would probably been simpler and more boring. So uh, I think the beauty of that part uh, comes uh, in a great way from the change of key. Cool. And what was great in that, that when I finally got the uh, setup I work with working and I was listening to the guitar part and playing live on top of that, uh, I kind of felt like uh, Thomas is here in the room playing with me. Mm. Uh, even if I know that that wasn't how it went, it, it kind of you got the feeling of performing with someone, even if there was thousands of kilometers in between. Yep. So, so in, in that sense, uh, I really enjoyed uh, working on that. And when you think of uh, what is the eventual result, practically it would be fair to say that it's composed by Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, and my work on that was uh, uh, mainly on the arrangement side, so kind of... A, 
how do you underline certain harmonies and certain notes in it. Uh, so uh, all in all, I really enjoyed working in it, uh, on it and uh, kind of uh, it was uh, uh, in many ways a kind of an inspiring thing like uh, uh, how do you approach uh, kind of uh, complementing someone else's uh, performance and, and composition uh, and well, I would say that you did, you yeah. did, you did complement it. Yeah. yeah, and 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 the idea there is exactly that because I think uh, the riffs on that song uh, are really strong. So so kind of a, there's no uh, need so to add anything into it. It's just kind of a to underline certain angles of that. Yeah. So uh, all in all, uh, you did end up even using that part in the beginning of the album. We actually made a reversed part of it. Uh, the, my uh, my um, studio engineer, uh, the guy who mixes all my albums, he is really creative. And he can twist and turn on a little thing, making it a brand new thing. So he did just that. So you open the album and close it. Yeah. Which is really fitting for an album called The Cathedral. Mm. You know? Yeah. yeah. So um, I thank you for that. Uh, hey. It tied together, as I told you, uh, my history in metal, you mm. know, to finally bring skepticism back into my life, but even closer than when I discovered you guys. Yeah. So that's a big deal for me. Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, I said uh, the reason for me to do this was the kind of a, uh, I found your music uh, interesting and insightful. So, so that was uh, even if I didn't know you at all why I would uh, jump on board of that. But ca can we reverse the roles for a moment? So mm. I'll ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. So then, uh, we have a situation where um, we have a Norwegian black metal or coming to Finland. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, for me, the question was, what do I do? So, of course, I, I will introduce you to the blackest Finnish black. Uh, how did you feel about the blackest Finnish black? I, I enjoyed it. The black, you know, you're referring to the black smoke sauna now. Yes. Yes, and uh, that was uh, authentic, is a word that pops in mind. And uh, uh, intense. But luckily, it was right next to the lake. So we could just run out and cool down and go back in. I really enjoyed that. I did. Yes, and, and there, the blackest black is the fact that the sauna has no chimney. So when you heat it up, uh, the walls get black with soot, mm -hmm. uh, and it's really deep matte black. Uh, and then it's also quite dark when you go there. So I, I thought it was fitting to get... Kind Absolutely, of... and I just uh, figured out that the, imagine a claustrophobe going in there. <laughs> <laughs> that might be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a bit too much. I think so. It wasn't too much for my wife, though. She, uh, she, it was a bit too intense for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, I would say um, you related to that as uh, as you would imagine someone who's working with blackness. Yeah. Uh, also, another thing we did uh, that I thought would be fitting is that um, the village I grew in at until the age of ten. Uh, has a medieval church in it that was built in 14 something, mm -hmm. 1452 or something like that. Uh, and that church has one of those organs, that particular one was built in the year 66. Mm. And um, we went to see that. So how was that for you? Uh, that was... Uh... A special moment, I must say. Uh, you you just basically drove to that church, and I was like, yeah, "Okay, we're going to look at that church." And then take some photos of the church walls and look at the old graves around there. And uh, I saw that the door was kind of opened, and I was like, "Hey, we, let's peek inside." And uh, Ira was like, yeah, "No, no, 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 no. Wait, something could be happening in there. Uh event or something." So okay, okay, I will leave it be. And then all of a sudden, this old guy showed up and uh, you obviously had planned something together with that guy and i was like okay what is going on now turned out that was the 
the organist of that church. Uh, that was actually the emeritus organist, so he was already on waking, uh, retired, but still he used to be the organist of that church for decades. Uh, yeah, and you can continue the story basically. You yeah. So what we did is we went into the church. Mm. Um, I politely asked uh, Thomas and the wife to take a seat, mm. and we went up and started the organ, and I uh, played Thomas's song, the outro, somewhat, and also uh, parts of the skepticism song, the arrival. Fittingly enough, um, the keyboards of that organ were uh, shorter than your normal 61 key, key one that I use for the band. Mm. Uh, but the highest key happened to be the highest note of the uh, guitar solo of the arrival. So there was some... Um, so at least now Thomas knows kind of what was the sound reference for uh, that outro of the Cathedral mm. album. So uh, that was that. It was a special, really special experience for me. And uh, hey, I thank you. Yet again, uh, you are most welcome. So, uh, kind of, a, <laughs> of course, when you think of um, from a high level, so when you get a black medal from Norway to visit, you of course take them to church. Of course, you do. Try yeah. to convert them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, there was that, and then we also visited a kind of um, ancient hill fort mm. on which people of the area uh, sought shelter from aggressors. A thousand years ago and, and, and such. So kind of a, no, you've seen. I've seen the sites. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the the cool part is that it's it's your area. You're, you're from there. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I uh, Two, three days well spent. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And kind of um, something that was kind of striking to me uh, as well, kind of how you described some of the motivation for your music and and what you appreciate in, in music of other Norwegian artists, for example, is that uh, when you drive on the mountains of Norway, mm. uh, for example, some uh, type of black metal may be describing how that feels uh, to you uh, perfectly. So kind of those are the Norwegian sites. Uh, maybe those sites that we saw yesterday and, and the day before are kind of a... Uh, the kind of a uh, southern Finland sites that are they're kind of plain, uh, but on the other hand, they can be also inspiring. Of course, uh, and kind of uh, I'm saying that uh, it wouldn't be inspiring as a whole, but kind of a uh, they can be inspiring uh, in a way that makes you create uh, or helps you create music that uh, you wouldn't normally associate with those sites. Mm. And, and I would believe your average Norwegian wouldn't uh, maybe say that the mountains feels like black metal. Uh, but on the other hand, why would your average movie music, like classical music, describe the mountains better than black metal? So yeah. I, I, I fully follow you on that. Yeah, yep, for sure, for sure. Okay, man. Uh, that's, I think that's it. You could uh, push what's in the future, what's coming up. Well, what you can tell, of course. What happened to me yesterday is that we went to the church. Uh, I played a real pipe organ a handful of times. Mm -hmm. And then um, I sat on that one and started playing. And um, of course, uh, the keyboards were different, the pedals were different uh, to an extent that my brain was hurting. Uh, the extent being that kind of a uh, when I've used to going up with the pedals, uh, they were still two octaves down, and and you could do so much more there. So personally, for me, for the coming years, I believe, I hope for myself that I would get into playing the actual pipe organ more, and and get more into that uh, brain hurting mode. Uh, for the band, uh, we have continued writing songs after the companion album as we do. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of shows coming up uh, in the summer of uh, 
2022, uh, we have a special show in the plan that would be a kind of a maybe a band defining show for early 2023 but there's no more detail to be shared yet and for the immediate future so that being the next hour or two i'm trying to negotiate mr erickson here to play some black doom with me uh, he doesn't know that yet, but I'm, I'm trying to negotiate him to doing it. That, that so so we'll see. Sounds interesting. <laughs> and we have a we have a bottle of champagne that the lovely Yanni from Skepticism brought us. Yeah, we have to pop that one too. That is one, and uh, well, we have about less than 24 hours uh, to spend, so we'll have to spend that wisely. Yeah, so uh, I hope. We will have still multiple decades with skepticism uh, and release multiple albums with six songs on them. On them. And then, uh, other than that, I'm open to anything that may happen. Hey, Edo, thank you very much. Hey, it's cool. Awesome. Uh, and uh, maybe the listeners could hear the sound of the handshake. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. It has been remarkable uh, getting to participate on the music and having you here in Finland. The, the honor is all mine. All right. Thank you. Signing out. For information regarding Mörk concert bookings, merchandising and other matters, please visit the official webpage www.mörkisebakke.no You can find the link in the description of this podcast episode. Thanks. <laughs>